Good evening. And it is a privilege to be with you all this evening. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I told Paul this. This is actually uh, kind of a, a new thing for me to do something like this. I've never actually been somewhere that I've shared for a weekend. I've shared a message here and there. So um, I, I hope you all are okay with with being a little bit of, uh, uh, I don't know, did I call you guinea pigs? Um, <clears throat> we're kind of feeling our way through. So I, I, I want you to, uh, um, I want you to be blessed. I want God to bless us this weekend as we spend time together. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's not, I hope you're not here tonight because I'm here. Because I'm just, I'm just me. I'm not, I'm not any more important than any of you are. And uh, the reason that I'm here is because we serve a God who's great and who loves us and who takes an interest in our lives. And <clears throat> Paul had shared with me a verse. Uh, he was twelve. The very first verse. <clears throat> Wherefore, seeing we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, are we surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses? We are, aren't we? And you know, as as I think of of uh, <clears throat> all of these witnesses. How often do you stop and think back about all the people who are listed in here? Do you think of them as witnesses for your race, for your life? Do you ever think of them that way? But they are. They are witnesses for our race today. I don't know how all that looks. I don't know if they can actually see us in our race. But I like to think of them as people who God cared about just like He cares about us. People who uh, he, he worked in their lives. He worked with their shortcomings. He worked with their same things that we face. And He used them. They were a part of His story. We have that written down here. They are witnesses for us. So I like that verse, Paul, and I think it fits very well with um, thinking about God's story and what He wants to do. Yeah, let's turn it on. Go ahead and turn it on. And I what I would like to do this evening is <clears throat> first of all, wake up my computer. See that okay? Looks clear enough. What I would like to do this evening is give you um, <clears throat> a little bit of visual for stories in the Bible. Um, <clears throat> my wife and I, my wife is here in Michigan, but not here this evening. We have uh, she has our two youngest there at Paul's house, and the second to the youngest started with a stomach bug or something two days ago, and she's still not feeling well enough to be here this evening, so we are hoping that maybe if she stays home tonight, she can come tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> we had the privilege, oh, let me think, three years ago, we had the privilege of taking a trip to this land and spending two weeks with a group, with a guide, interestingly, from Michigan, who led us, taught us, showed us the land of the Bible. 
and we spent two weeks trekking around in that country and uh, somebody in the group had a, a step counter on and at the end of our two weeks of time they calculated that we had we had hiked a little over 100 miles uh, we were all over in any kind of terrain there it was an extremely interesting time <coughs> There is something about understanding the Bible, understanding Scripture, what I will call in its context, that in my life has brought a, a new life to Scripture, has brought a new... Uh, and you know, I, 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 I don't want to make it sound like you have to have this to understand the Bible. So please don't hear me saying that. For me, it has been an extremely helpful thing. It has been something that has it has just literally changed my life. And honestly, it's something that has made me, especially in my calling as someone to do stuff like this, to share from Scripture, has made me do everything, go from doing everything I could to avoid these opportunities, to actually enjoying these opportunities, to, to feeling like the Bible is so rich and so full that there is never enough time to share all the richness that's in it. And that has been a huge blessing for me. <clears throat> so what I would like to do this evening is just to give you a little feel, a little taste, a little introduction to what that has been. And what I would like for it to be for you is... Um, Someone described it as, you know, we use different tools. We use, in, in our work we have, depending on what your work is, say you're a carpenter in particular, you have a toolbox, you have a tool bag, you have tools that you carry with you, and you use different tools for different jobs. We have tools that we use in our Bible study. And we have many good tools that we use in studying Scripture and understanding Scripture. What I would like to give you tonight is perhaps unless you've come across this before, is perhaps a new tool to put in your toolbox for studying Scripture. Um, someone described it <clears throat> this way. Studying the Scripture in its context, do you ever think about, uh, and I thought about it, Ivan, when you said this this evening, you, you mentioned that the verse says this in English, but it says it this way in German. That is so true in so many ways because the Bible was not actually written initially in English, right? What was it written in? Greek. Okay. The New Testament. The New Testament is in Greek. The Old Testament in Hebrew. I want, to, I want to get you in and engage just a little bit here this evening, okay? This is not just about me standing up here giving you a lecture. I, I like feedback so that I know if we're connecting. So feel free to speak up if you have a question. If, you have, if I ask for something, I, I want you to respond, all right? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> can you read that? Why don't you stand up? <clears throat> All of you heard this before. <clears throat> because I love to do this at home. I don't do it as much as I used to. This is Hebrew. These are the words of what is called Shema. Those, that first word there. This is the Hebrew. It comes out of Deuteronomy 6. <clears throat> and just to give you a little taste, and I, and I, I heard that this evening, and that, that's interesting to me. You all, I don't know how many of you know German or know Dutch. 
I grew up only knowing English, and so I only had one language. But when you have two languages, you realize that it's really hard to communicate something from one language to another. You, it, you, you, depending what it is, when you, when you translate something from one language into another language, you have to work to get the same ideas, the same tone, the same, exactly the same thing. So, I want to give you just a taste of the Hebrew tonight. So, I will say the Hebrew, you repeat it after me, alright? Just as a, doesn't matter how it sounds, just say it, and I'll say this, if you are Jewish, you say it at the top of your lungs, alright? So, don't worry if you make the ceiling vibrate a little bit. Now, you don't have to. But understand that it's said with all your heart. Okay? So, I'll start off and you say it after me. Shema Israel. Shema Israel. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. Ve'ahavta. Et Adonai. Eloecha. Amen. Try that. Now say it after me again. Hear, O Israel. The Lord is our God. The Lord alone. Love the Lord your God. With all your heart. With all your soul. With all your might. Love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. All right. Very good. Um, that gives you just a little bit of, of a sense of the difference in what people in Jesus' day, I believe, would have heard. And, and honestly, I believe that Jesus, in his time frame, would have grown up saying those words at least a couple times a day. Those words were really important to the Jewish people. And they, that was their way of expressing to God, God, you are my God. You are God alone. I want to love you with all I've got. I want to be totally yours. I want to, and, and that was their way of reminding themselves. They would go so far as to say, this is our way of being born again. We make our commitment to God. That we want to follow him with all we all we've got. Um, thank you for saying that. You may be seated. <clears throat> that word now, if, you, if he, the Hebrew language, I think Hebrew language has something like um, I want to say like eight thousand words. It is a what is called a poor language, not in the sense that you can't express yourself, but Poor in the sense that there aren't a lot of words to express yourself. English language is more like 140,000 words. It's, it's, it's so many words. And so if you think about it, and you, you understand this, if you understand two different languages, you understand the difficulty of taking one language, especially something like that, Hebrew, that has only, say, 8,000 words, and expressing that same thing in a language that uses so many more words to say things, um, you understand why when you pick up different English versions, different English translations, you have the differences in how you, I, you said that this evening, Ivan, that you, you um, the English is translated this way. If I read the German, I would probably translate it this way. And you, you, it's not wrong, but you have those differing ways of looking at things. And so you have the differences in English translations then, but you understand just a little bit of the difficulty of trying to translate accurately the original. And so part of what has been good for me is to try to go back and, and it is, in, in our day, it is actually much easier because it is much more, uh, there's so much more things available to us today than there were even 30 years ago. But in, in our day, more people are starting to recognize what we have missed by not 
trying to hear, um, you know, what was, who, who was Jesus? Where did he grow up? Nazareth. In Nazareth, which was where? Galilee. Galilee, which was where? Israel. Israel, which is who? What was his nationality? Jewish. He's a Jew. And so he talked like a Jew. He thought like a Jew. In a lot of ways, he acted like a Jew. And so if I want to understand Jesus, it is helpful to understand his culture. You know, someone shared it this way, and I, I don't want to take, is that clock accurate? Quarter to eight? Okay, you didn't give me a ending time. No, I didn't. Okay. It's okay. Do you want to give me one? <clears throat> um, someone said it this way. I get carried away because I get, I get enthused with this stuff. If you would say, say, say you would spend eight years, every day, you would come here for eight hours, you would look into this room through that window. Try to imagine that. Every day, for eight years, you would come and you would look in that window for eight hours. That's what you did. Do you think that if I took this and moved it, you would notice. If you spent that much time observing this room from that perspective, yeah? You would probably notice. Sure. <clears throat> now, if one day you came and you looked into this room from this window, would you see something different than what you saw when you looked in from this window? Yes. Yes, thank you. But would anything have changed? Now I didn't I put the chair back. Would anything have changed? No. But you would have a totally different perspective of the room. Now I'll add this. If you would look in that window and you would write a book about this room totally from that perspective, then you would take the book and someone else would take the book and they would read the book and they would be looking in from this window. Is it possible there would be things in the book that they wouldn't understand because of their perspective? Do you understand where I'm going? All right, good. <clears throat> so, let's talk about Shema for just a little bit. Because this is one of those words that typically you see translated as hear. Hear, O Israel. But Shema is one of the words that <clears throat> is so much richer and deeper. Um, actually, if you look, a lot of times the word obey is also the word Shema. So Shema does not only mean to hear, but it also means to obey. <clears throat> there are four different levels to the word Shema. First one is hearing. It's hearing sounds. So you hear sounds. That is Shema. Second one is understanding the sounds that you hear. It goes in and you hear it and you recognize it. It's words. It's intelligible. Third level is when I hear something and I understand it and it touches me. It, I, you know, it, it, I feel it. It's, it creates emotion in me. But then there's another level that is, you know, you can do each of those first three. You can tell your child to go and do something and they can hear you and they can understand you, and they can even go so far as to feel a little bit of emotion, but if you come back later and they have not actually done the job that you asked them to do, what do you say? You didn't listen, right? It's a little bit that same idea. If hearing does not get all the way to the fourth level, where it actually puts your feet in motion, it actually changes who you are. That, that is, that is um, now so you take that word and you try to translate, how are you going to translate it? It's difficult because there's so much more packed into that one little word. So when you see that word, if you would read it in the Hebrew, 
there is, it's, it's like a whole suitcase full in that one little word. <clears throat> so what I want to try to do this evening now is give you just a few, um, <coughs> if I can remember the, the order of my pictures here, <clears throat> try to give you just some, some visuals for uh, a few stories. And uh, actually, I have a couple other things I just remembered. <clears throat> this is the text. I will refer to the text. The Bible is the text. In its context. And there are particularly, there's probably a little bit more than this, but, but broadly speaking, you can put six different categories. As you study the text, um, <clears throat> questions that you should ask as you look at scripture. Um, one is history. Do I, under, do I understand the history? Thank you. I'm proud of you for just moving to where you can see. Why are you leaving? <clears throat> um, is there things, are there things in history that, I, that are helpful for me to know as I read this scripture? Are there cultural things Things that took place in their culture that are helpful for me in understanding a story in the text. Um, are there things in geography? You know, location. This part of Michigan, at least, is totally different from Arkansas, where I come from. And there are things about what happens here in Michigan that if I understand the geography, I'll go home now and I'll have a little different picture of where Paul and Katie live and the community that they're a part of, because I've seen it. I, I know better what it's like here in Michigan, and so that helps me when I hear stories of Michigan, I have different pictures to plug into that story. Um, visual things, kind of along the same line. Are there, are there things that when they heard a word, when they heard a, a, a statement, a story, are there things that they thought of and saw in their minds Language, we talked about that a little bit. And also literary, the way, um, the way things are written, the styles of, of <clears throat> literature. Um, there, I'm telling you, there is so much in stuff like that that there are times when, as I, as I read across what people find and understand, um, it's, just, it's almost mind-boggling. There's so much different things out there. <laughs> Sometimes I, I don't even want to give people stuff because it's like overload. It, it, it's, it's almost too much. But just, just to give you a little bit of a taste, um, if I say these words to you, I'm mad about my flat, what would you think? A tire. A tire. I was, actually yesterday, I was somewhere and my dad was there also and his car had a tire. Now, if I go about 3,000 miles away to England and I say those exact same words, I'm mad about my flat, what would they think? Is there a flat of land or not? Okay, you're headed the right direction, not quite. Yes, I love my new apartment. How in the world can those words mean something so totally different? That is... Anyway. <clears throat> the text, in its context, you don't have to know it, but there are times when it makes a lot of difference. <clears throat> so, just... just I want to give you, well that's not, I can't see that very well. Can you see that much? <clears throat> Just a little taste. This is a picture of, this is a view from the top of Mount, we call it caramel. Like a caramel apple. Somebody said this is where those apples come from, Mount Carmel. That's not true. <clears throat> you would say Mount Carmel. 
Um, this is an olive grove. These are olive trees. These are beautiful trees. Um, hundreds of years old. Some of them were huge olive trees. And uh, I just want to give you a little picture of the beautiful view down from the top of Mount Carmel. <clears throat> down across, you can't see it real well, but you can get you can get a little bit of it. That helped. All right. That is a mountain goat in Israel called an ibex. And uh, beautiful goats. We actually, that one you can see has a tracking collar or something on it. We actually got fairly close to a couple of these. Um, amazing creatures. And uh, <coughs> I think most of them would be clearer than that last one was, Paul. <coughs> Do you know where they live? Places like this. And I cannot give you the sense of what it is like to see a hillside like that. that most of that looks like it is almost straight up. And those goats go up and down that like you walk through this room. Just up and down like nothing. And the interesting thing is, I looked just this evening. There are three different places where Scripture talks about um, having feet like a deer. You know those Scriptures? David talks about it. Habakkuk talks about it. Um, I believe Samuel was one of the other places that it talks about having the feet of a deer. You know one of the interesting things? You, you know what the feet of a deer, the feet of an ibex, what does it take to run up and down those rocks like that. Could you do that? Probably no. Not. No way. No way. But they have the feet for their path. Right? God has given them what they need for the terrain that He placed them in. And their feet act like, I don't know that they literally are, but they act like suction cups. And they can run up and down those rocks like, I mean, even the little ones. It's incredible. And I love that picture because then I realize that whenever I ask God to give me feet like a deer, it is not so much that I'm asking Him to give me a nice smooth path, as it is that I'm trusting Him to give me the right feet for the path that I'm on. If He has me on a path like that, I can trust Him to give me the feet that I need to run up and down those rocks. It may be hot. It may be a little difficult. But He will give me the feet I need for the path. And I love that picture. <clears throat> and I love to think about those little goats and the example that they are of God's provision. <clears throat> Water is a huge thing in the land of Israel. <coughs> um, so much of it is hot and dry. Um, just And so when you see water, just proof that we were there, when you see water, you stop and you enjoy it. And uh, water is, a, you know, we need water here. Right? I don't know. I don't know how it is for you right now in Arkansas. Right now, we feel like we almost have too much water. We've been getting so much rain that that uh, it's it's been a little difficult this spring even to get gardens planted and things like that because it's been so wet. But places like this where you where you have a drier climate, water is uh, you feel so much more how how important water is for life, how, how much you need it to sustain you. And uh, can, you, can you see that? Water coming out of the rocks. And it's, it's amazing to see the, uh, see the formations and then see this water coming out of the rocks. And one of the really interesting things was they said, I don't know how you would verify this, but they claim that the water here 
entered, I mean, the, the terrain over there is so rocky, a lot of it is. And they, they, they claim that the water that is coming out here entered somewhere else possibly as long as 30 years ago. And it's emerging here now. It would have been rainfall somewhere else. Now, if you think about that, isn't that amazing? To think that on the day I was here, if I was hot, dry, thirsty, I could go down here and I could get water to refresh myself. And that water fell somewhere 30 years ago as God's preparation for me here on the day that I was here. Do you, do you know God like that? Is that how you see God? Is He someone who cares so much about you that He sent rain 30 years ago or longer ago so that you have what you need today? To me, that's a beautiful picture. To understand, it's a little bit like having feet for the path. But it's, it's the same thing in a way. Um, God knows and, and puts, sets in motion what is needed for me for next week. And if I think of God acting that way, I can go today, tomorrow, I can go, get to next week with confidence because I know that someone was taking care of having the things in place that I will need for next week. My dad today traveled from Ohio to, um, to Indiana. And I'm not sure what all, it would be interesting to hear his story now this evening because he had um, little, little hose first thing this morning. And so his car was down. Got a part, fixed it, went a little bit, blew it again because it wasn't the right part. They just fixed it temporarily because they couldn't get the right thing. Found a different part. They found a metal part instead of a plastic part. Repaired it again. Went most of the way, but we heard just about the time we got to Paul's, he broke down again, and this time the car was down. And he wasn't to his destination yet. <clears throat> but after we were at Paul's, um, somebody sent us a message, and they had a picture of someone loading his car onto a trailer. So it would be really interesting to hear, was there something that God was preparing prior so that he had what he needed today to take care of the rocky places that he had to walk today? You know, he would have much preferred to just get in his car and go and his car work right and everything be smooth. That's what we, that, that's... Are you like me? That's what I think of as blessings. And it is. But can I also see the blessing in having days when it looks like rocks and all uphill and difficult things and realize that even in those times, God gives me what I need. He provides feet for the path. He provides water in whatever form it is, He takes care of me. He takes care of us. <clears throat> and there are times when you're on a hot, dry path and you are going and you're going and you're going and you wonder if the path will ever end and suddenly you come around the corner and you see this. Can you see what that is? I can't see it very well. Can you tell what it is? It's a pool of water. It's a pool of water with a big waterfall coming down. And I'm telling you, there is nothing more beautiful than seeing that sight after you've been hiking for a couple hours and it's 100 degrees. And it's hot and it's dusty and it's dry. And I think you would have a really hard time keeping most people out of that. Because you just want to get in and soak it up. That is, a, that is such a gift. 
at the end of a hike like that. It was wonderful. And God gives us that. He gives us, not always, but He always gives us enough. Sometimes it's this huge, I'm telling you, I, my wife would tell you, I'm not a water person. I can go sit beside water, even when it's pretty hot, and not get much more than my feet wet. And I'm fine. I don't really like swimming. But when I got to that waterfall, I wanted in. And I went and stood under that and just let it pour down on top of me. That felt so good. So good. And, and you know, there is something about those hot, dry times. You will never enjoy a waterfall the same way if you don't have those hot, dry times. You honestly won't. Because if it's pleasant and it's wet, the waterfall doesn't mean there's much. <clears throat> Talking about those waterfalls, but they be what temperature would those be? Oh, I don't know. It wasn't real cold. I don't know what it, I don't know what it was. I didn't bother to stop and measure the temperature. No, it, it was it was like I would assume that your creek water here, do you call them creeks? Your like small springs. stream with we'll springs too. Yeah. That it would probably be colder water mm -hmm. here than what it was there. Um, so it wasn't like it was just a shock cold when you when you got wet like that. It was probably a little bit warmer. <coughs> this is a little bit, and you know not all of Israel is like this, but a lot of it is. Um, in interesting thing, the uh, if you know, I wish I had a map up here right now, just, just to point out, there are several wildernesses in Israel territory. And there is roughly, I think they say that there is roughly 70% of Israel's land is this. It's dry and barren land. And, and the rabbis made an interesting observation because they look at at, um, they look at the land where God placed them and they compare it to life. And their observation is if the land where God placed us is 70% hot and desert, you know the interesting thing is that where did God take Israel after he took them out of Egypt, after he chose them to be his people, where does he take them? takes them to the desert. And he actually goes so far as to say, later on, the desert, the wilderness, is his land. And later, whenever they experience richness and fall away from him, he actually says, let me take you back. Let's go back. you remember what it was like when we were in the wilderness? Let me take you back to the wilderness, because in the wilderness we enjoyed such, this is my own words, we enjoyed such rich times together that we haven't had since you're in a place where you have more things. And so the rabbis made the observation that since Israel is roughly 70% wilderness, maybe we should expect life to be 70% wilderness. So we maybe shouldn't be as surprised you know, maybe we, we here in America, I don't know, do we experience more, um, do you think of them as blessings? We have so much. We have, really, we have so little need because we've got it all. Is it hard for us to have that closeness with God? 
because we don't experience this. Should we, um, I started to say this a minute ago, we think of abundance as being God's blessing. And it is. I believe it is. Should we, um, I can't think now how, how to word this, we tend to get used to abundance. And we tend to, if you're like me, we tend to see abundance as normal. It's the expected thing. And when we don't have the abundance, we think either I've done something wrong, or for some reason God's not blessing me. And maybe we should learn to see abundance as a miracle. You know, we see that as this is the unusual, that I have so much. That's hard to do. It really is. <clears throat> Someone visiting in the, in the U.S. from another country where they suffer persecution, um, they actually moved to the U.S. because of, of threats on their life. And as they were visiting in a church one Sunday, there was a, they were having a baptismal service. And uh, this person, the, it was a lady, and, and the family that she was with, um, he noticed that she was agitated about something as they were going through the service. And he was afraid that it was something, you know, something offensive, something that um, was bothering her because of, different culture, different way of doing things. And so he finally asked her, is something wrong? And her response was, why is everybody just sitting here? And he didn't understand. <clears throat> he didn't understand immediately what she was talking about. But she said, we are sitting here, we're having this special service, and everybody's just sitting here. Why aren't you standing up and jumping and praising God that we can be here and have this service and not be afraid of someone coming in the back door and hauling us off. She said, this is a miracle. And you know, that, that is so much how I tend to approach life because that's what I'm used to. And I have a service like this and it's just normal. And I don't realize that this is a miracle. That we can have a time like this when we can sit and talk and interact with each other, with God. And we're not molested. We have the freedom to do it. It's not necessarily like this. And it's a huge blessing. But maybe... It's not actually the norm. <clears throat> when you're in a land like this, what do you think are the dangers in this land? <coughs> What's, what comes to your mind? It's hot and dry, rugged. Hydration. Hydration. Water. What else? Starvation. Starvation. Food. What else? Danger of falling. Okay. Falling. Good. Anything else? High temperatures. Right. Heat. You know, there's places here, we didn't actually experience it. I, I think while we were there, high temperature was not, probably not over 100, but, but, um, there are times when you are there and it, the temperature hits 120 every day. And it's just, it's, it's hot. It's incredibly hot. <clears throat> Anything else? <coughs> they have these critters. Okay. And they're probably not as much now as they used to be. But yeah, there are some wild animals. There are things called scorpions. 
you have to watch out for. Um, but actually, one of the things in some of these places that is the biggest danger, kills the most people, is floods. Do you know that? <clears throat> you see, this, what do you call those here? Do you have any of those here? Lost. Well, it's like a, it's like a little valley starting there. Canyon. Canyon, okay. I don't know what your term is for them here. We, at home, we sometimes, the, the locals there especially, we call it a power. Not sure why. That's what we call a little ravine like that. We would call it a ravine or maybe it, not, not likely a canyon. Um, a holler is more likely what we would call it. Um, in, in Israel, you call it a wadi. W-A-D-I, wadi. <clears throat> and in these wadis, there's a little bit you can see going up through there. <coughs> there are lots of them. You see the terrain. See how rocky it is? It doesn't rain often there. Can you imagine what a rain would be like if it rained? There's nowhere for the water to go. It doesn't soak in. And actually while we were there, um, it was a little bit more, I think it was actually a little bit unusual for it to be raining as much as it was. We, we experienced very little rain, but the danger here is it can be sky like that and you think there's no danger, but maybe 20, 30 miles away, it rains and the water ends up down in here and whenever it comes through there it's just like this and so you can only see that far <clears throat> let me see if I can I, I was not able to put this in my program but it's worth it's worth enough that I'm going to take the time to show you because this is the only way that you get the full impact in the desert are amazing. say that it sounds a little bit like a freight train. And when you hear it, you have about five seconds to get out of the way. <clears throat> In that video, you understand. <laughs> you know, I could stand here and tell you that, but until I saw that, I didn't actually see that, that happen with my own eyes. Until I saw that video of it happening, you cannot grasp exactly what it's like. 
but to see that and to hear that fear in, 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 the, in the voices, you understand what it's like to be uh, in a flood in the desert. <clears throat> so let me close with a little story. <clears throat> Jesus told a story one time. <clears throat> And he said, whoever hears these words of mine, does hearing remind you of something? Oh, we're, wow. Thank you. I was hoping somebody would remember. Whoever hears these words of mine and does them, whoever shamas my words, he's like a wise man who built his house on a rock. Now, I should tell you, when you have floods like that, <clears throat> do you know what happens when the water swirls around corners? What happens? You have this little eddy in the inside corner, right? And what, what stays there as the waters go by? The topsoil, the sand. And you'll find down in here I probably should have said this before I started the story. You'll find down in here some of the some of the nicest, cleanest sand, and, and and they use it. That's that's their building sand. They they will use that sand. They won't go to the seashore. They will get the sand out of the wadi. Um, that's what they use to for for building. <coughs> You also have in those those corners. Sometimes it's not sand so much that it leaves, as it is a sticky mud, sticky residue. That some of I don't know how the dirt is here. Does the dirt get sticky when it gets wet? You know what dirt is like. Whenever you it gets wet and you walk across it, and the farther you go, the taller you get. You know what I'm talking about? If you have clay here. Yeah. yeah. That's how it is, and so much so that that uh, I heard a story of a tour bus that tried to get off the road and drive out across the field, and he got part ways out, and he had so much mud on his tires that he just literally couldn't go. And <clears throat> anyway, um, let me continue with the story. Jesus said. If you hear his words, and you do them, you're like a man who built his house on the rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and they couldn't, couldn't touch the house, because it's built on a rock. But if you hear his words, and you don't do them, you're like a man who built his house on the sand. And the wind, the rains came, and the floods, and his house is destroyed because it was built on the sand. And when you see pictures like this and you understand the setting, I believe that his audience, when they heard him say those words, the picture that came to their mind is... <clears throat> The wise man, his house is up here. The flood won't touch it because it's up where it's safe. It's built up on the rock. The foolish man, on the other hand, built his house on the sand. What happens when the flood comes? I, 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 I see... Jesus' audience shaking their heads and said, somebody, somebody else used this <coughs> illustration and I think it fits so well and I figured that you, this would fit with you all because you know, you know Lake Michigan. He said, it would be like me telling you that I'm going to build a new house and I'm going to be able to see Lake Michigan out of all four sides. 
and you ask me, how could I do that? And I'd say, I'm going to build it on the ice. What would you think? What would you call me? Foolish. <laughs> okay. You got the point. It's not, maybe not so much about the foundation as it is about the location. And you know, it's not necessarily that we've gotten that story wrong all these years. But I gave you a little different picture now. And take it and plug it in where you need to. It's not not that I'm, you know, not that, not that I'm saying that we've viewed the Bible incorrectly, but there is the side of, of seeing this that um, you see a big, a big body. We actually literally had um, one area here where they, they were not going to let us hike because it had sprinkled somewhere about 30 miles away. And, and uh, it, was a, it was in a national park and they were not going to let us hike there because it was too dangerous. And the only way they let us in was if our guide kept his phone turned on. And when we got up here where we crossed this wadi, we just crossed the wadi and we stayed out of the wadi. That was the only way. And he would, he, they knew the guide. That was the only way they would let us up there. That's how dangerous it is. That's how serious they take it. <clears throat> So, I'm going to take you back now to this picture. And I showed you a few things here this evening. You remember how pretty this picture is? How much you learned from this picture? I want to show you what reading the text in its context has done for me. And if it does that for you, praise the Lord. If it doesn't, that's fine. God uses different things in, for each of us in our journey. But this is what reading the text in its context has done for me. It's like going from black and white to full color. And so, as, as we study, as we learn together this weekend, <coughs> I don't know. I don't know if this is a good way to end or not. But I love this saying. Not because I think of you all as horses. You know the saying, you can lead a horse to water, can't make him drink. But what's the secret? Do you know that saying? Feed them salt cubes. Huh? Feed them salt cubes. Thank you. You can put salt in his feet. My passion has become salting the feet. I want to give you something, not so that you taste what I've tasted, but I want to give you something that creates a hunger in you, that creates a thirst for water, so that you go and you search for it, and you find it, because you're thirsty. 